Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Asa Hendricks Petrie. I'm very excited to welcome you all here this afternoon to today's event on behalf of Brooklyn Public Library, New York Public Library, and Queens Public Library's Culture Class Program. Uh, we do ask, which I appreciate, I've already noticed you guys have done this, but uh, please keep yourself muted unless otherwise noted by a host or um, anyone leading the program here, just so that we can, of course, hear each other during the panel. I want to remind everyone quickly that this event is being recorded for future rebroadcasts on Culture Passion's website. Um, so just please note that if you do turn your camera on or unmute yourself, uh, you are then consenting to being recorded. Um, I also want to point out that closed captioning is available for today's program. You should see it on your screen now. If you'd like to turn it on or off, uh, you can feel free to do so at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, that's most of the housekeeping, but I do want to quickly introduce you here to Culture Pass. If you're unfamiliar, some of you might know it, some might be uh, new to the program. Um, Culture Pass is the program that allows our cardholders at three of New York City's public library systems to reserve free passes uh, to participate at cultural sites across all five of our boroughs. So um, if you'd like to browse those offerings, you can visit our website here. Um, you will be able to see our homepage here on the screen. Hopefully, you can see my screen being shared. In order to use it, I'll quickly just run you through it here. You're going to select the library system that you have a card with. Um, super easy, depending on where you're located, what library you are uh, subscribed to. You'll be taking this login screen uh, right here. And this is where you'll put in your username and barcode, your PIN too, as if you're logging into a library website. And then once you're logged in, you'll be able to access all of these opportunities, um, both virtual offerings such as today's program, as well as in-person things coming up in the summer. So we're super excited for things to be opening up more and very optimistic about our chances to, to yeah, resume visiting these sites um, for free with Culture Pass, uh, thanks to that. Um, but without further ado, I do want to get transitioning towards our main event, why you guys are all here. Uh, I want to especially thank our friends at Alice Austin House for putting this event together today, um, particularly in time for International Transgender Day of Visibility. Uh, just super excited to have this panel here and meet all these talented artists and um, his, his friend, uh, specialists uh, to, to have this discussion, this dialogue here together. Um, and if you enjoy the program we have today, it is part of a series taking place uh, throughout the summer. So please check back to see other programs going on. Uh, I know for a fact we're going to have another one with Alice Austin. So keep in touch there if you want to attend another event with us virtually. Um, and yeah, I encourage you to check it out. So thank you for that. And last but not least, I know you're all very excited. Well, through generous uh, funding from Stavros Niarcos Foundation, Charles A. Redson Foundation, New York Community Trust, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and uh, the libraries, all of us are very grateful for all the support and enabling this dialogue to happen here and this to all come together today. So um, now, without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Executive Director of Alice Austin House, Victoria Monroe, who will be kicking things off. Um, and just thank you guys again for coming together today in this space. And I'm very excited to, uh, to experience this along with you guys. So thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. And, you know, thank you so much for this wonderful program um, today as well being hosted by the libraries. Um, it's just so wonderful to see all your faces here now that um, we've stopped screen sharing. I'm so thankful um, to Eliza Steinbock who has gone on this curatorial journey um, with us at the Alice Austin House. And I just like to say, because this is really a forum for uh, Eliza and our artists to share. Um, for anyone that isn't aware, the Alice Austin House is one of 23 historic houses in New York. It's located on Staten Island's waterfront. It is the um, home of Alice Austin, who was born in 1866. She was a prolific photographer, lesbian, and our site is now very thankfully since 2017, a nationally designated site of LGBTQ history. Um, we are a living, breathing photographic museum with three changing exhibitions a year. And it has been such a joy to work with Eliza and Zachary Drucker, Joanna Jackie Bayer, Della Grace Volcano and Texas Isaiah on bringing this exhibition together, which is seated so beautifully in our historic galleries. So without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Eliza Steinbock. 
Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, and also thank you for the invitation um, already some years ago. Um, it was really exciting to be able to, to meet you at a conference in Berlin. And now here we are uh, virtually joining you uh, in, the, in the New York area. Um, it's only, it's only uh, sad that uh, we're not able to actually convene um, in person on site at this beautiful waterfront uh, property. Um, but this does make it possible uh, <laughs> without a lot of difficulty to have uh, a global conversation. I see a lot of my uh, friends and contacts here in, in, um, in Europe and further abroad, as well as family uh, tuning in from Kentucky. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, I'd like to do uh, basically a, a first round of um, getting to meet our, our speakers, um, the participating artist of Radical Tenderness, um, Trans for Trans Portraiture. I want to give a personal introduction because um, that was how I actually curated the show. Um, for me, it's about um, photographers who work closely with their sitters, right? They're, they're not just their models, but their friends, their intimates, their lovers, their muses, um, and exude a certain kind of tenderness um, in, in the photographs. So um, I want to also give a kind of gesture, um, as they have, of, of connection. So if we could start the slide um, with uh, Della Grace Volcano. Thank you. Um, so I was 22 years old when I traveled to London um, to meet Della Grace Volcano and interview him. Um, I was particularly interested in a video called Pansexual Public Porn um, that at the time um, was, yeah, one of the few kinds of sexual imagery with trans people that I, I could locate. Um, and it was alternative and wild and, and funky. Um, and the people in there were identifying as tranny boys. And that, that was something that I was like, oh, me, maybe, maybe me too. Um, and in our conversations about this particular photograph um, Volcano made um, of David, um, it turned out that David was one of the people in pansexual public porn. So I felt kind of looping back of our relationship and conversations. Um, Del welcomed me into his house and I was so impressed with um, how clever and uh, tender and humorous um, he was and, and also with the work of uh, documenting Zach Nataf um, that I knew of from before. If we could look at the next uh, slide. Um, so we, we had conversation over a pile of books um, talking about intersex and trans uh, scholarship. And I was also thinking about all of the queer luminaries that had come through that apartment, um, many of whom uh, have been yeah, shot or <laughs> photographed by Dell. And um, I know that one day he hopes to make a book with the portraits of all of these um, incredible queer activists and artists. Now, currently, um, Dell has uh, a body of work being auctioned by the center on Halstead in Chicago. So if you are located in the United States, I can highly recommend you visit that auction um, and, and put a bid in. Um, Dell, if you would like to unmute, um, I, I welcome you to, to, to greet uh, the audience and also if you have anything else that you'd like to add, uh, any, to plug or, or to say about the occasion mm -hmm. today and, and beef. Sure. Um, well, I would say that um, the people that I'm working with, like from David, um, David was a case of sublimation because um, Back then, I thought somebody who was 20 years younger than me was um, way too young. So I learned how to sublimate my desire and um, make photographs instead. And um, I guess it was also about oftentimes people, um, I'm attracted to people, but it's not always a genital attraction. With Zach, it was kind of, um, we were both Americans living in London. We were 
born the same month, the same year. Um, and we found a lot of um, common ground. And Zach was also um, founded f to m London. And even though I didn't identify as a trans man, but as non-binary, well, we called it genderqueer then. Um, Zach was very welcoming. And when he asked me to photograph his transition, um, it was great. And we worked together for a few years making images every month, most of which have not been seen. Um, so I think I'll leave it at there. I think there's another picture that you chose for the, the book mm -hmm. um, that was one I overlooked for many years, um, but what I'm real that I'm really, really excited about. Um, it's Zach's back and it joins a long catalog of works I've done with my own back and other people's backs um, that you've also written about. So, but I'll leave it there. That's, um, yeah, yeah, thank you so much. It. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's, there's now I think an article to be, uh, at least to be written or extended about the backs of a uh, volcano. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to now go to Zachary's uh, slide. Thank you. Um, so Zachary, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us today in this conversation. Um, I uh, was first personally connected to you by mutual artist friends when you were in the Netherlands. Um, you had uh, uh, work showing um, in Maastricht. Um, it was this incredible trans loving research, I'm sorry, re relationship project that you uh, created with Rhys Ernst. Um, and of course, since that time, um, you have uh, now had roles as a, a producer on the docu-series, This Is Me in the series Transparent that has uh, won you an Emmy, a nod and a win, and also a Golden Globe. Um, Zachary has an incredible knack for bringing audiences into close emotional intimacy um, with your, your trans film muses. Um, and that includes this series that we are showing with Rosalind Blumenstein. Um, and I want to also plug uh, everyone, please go check out um, Zachary's um, new venture, which is also a televisual uh, documentary um, about trans woman, Elizabeth Carmichael, who invented a fuel efficient three wheeled car. And the series is called The Lady in the Dale, which you can watch on HBO. Um, now, Zachary, you don't have to talk about uh, Liz Carmichael at this moment, but I'd just like for you to have a moment to um, to greet the audience and if there's anything you'd like to add in the, in your introduction. Hey, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. I'm a mega fan of everybody um, on this panel. Um, Jackie Bayer, Della Grace Volcano, Texas Isaiah, who I'm also a fan of Texas Isaiah's uh, partners podcast Fanti and I've caught on that Texas is I say it sometimes is referred to as TI <laughs> by the co-host um Eliza thank you so much for including my work in this show and for your scholarship and for championing my work and I'm also a huge fan of Alice Austin I wrote a research paper when I was studying photography at the School of Visual Arts on Alice Austin as an early queer um, creator of, of images and have always felt a kind of kinship with her, specifically because she was a cross-dresser and um, it's mentioned in the exhibition text that my great-grandmother was an immigrant from, um, you know, what was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and at 18 years old came alone to New York City um, and lived in the Lower East Side in a tenement um, with like a dozen or more people. And she walked to the garment district to work every day from the Lower East Side. Um, and that's her on the left. And I, yeah, have always known about this history of my great grandmother being, um, you know, gender expansive and 
I was always captivated by Alice Austin doing the same kind of play with her friends um, as seen behind Victoria Monroe's. Yep, that's Alice <laughs> over Victoria's left shoulder. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. Yeah, I love this connection um, that's that's being made with your family via the Alice Austin House, um, and and I'm so glad that it came out in in our conversation um, that we had in preparation of the, the kind of mini catalog. Um, yeah, so we will. I think definitely later in in. Um, in our in our roundtable, I want to um, flesh out some of the connections in terms of being gender expansive and having um, kind of accomplished gender freedoms in domestic spaces. Um, so for now, though, I'd like to move to uh, Johanna Jackie Beyer. I know as Jackie. Um, so uh, I first got to know um, Jackie after a screening. Uh, <laughs> I'll stick with the language of, of the fandom like <laughs> Zachary was using. Um, I was completely enamored and really actually just blown away by this documentary she made um, called Julia. Um, yeah, title, title is also the protagonist. Um, it was screening at a festival in Berlin and um, a, we had a mutual friend who introduced us, um, Zachy Lo um, Scotty Loist. Um, and I'm so excited that we're going to screen Julia um, during the summer program. Uh, so sometime between now and, and June at the Alice Austin House outdoors. Uh, so it'll be COVID safe. Um, so for those who are able to go see it, be sure to book a ticket. Um, so this documentary follows or conveys, I would say, conveys the life of Julia, who Jackie met while working at the Royal Bar. And the photographs that we are showing um, come from this period when Jackie was creating them with the other girls working there. And um, I was so excited when Jackie agreed to be interviewed. Um, this was 2014. Um, I had a, a research project working with trans photographers. Um, and, and she agreed to have many long, long conversations with me, uh, endless coffees. Um, and I learned that she had this whole other career as a television director of hugely popular dramas and soap operas uh, for German speaking people. Um, we can, maybe you wanna mention the titles later. I think one is the Marienhof. Um, and then at the same time, um, Jackie has been documenting, this is now decades long, um, the punk queer and gritty party nightlife of Berlin. And of course the luminaries uh, of, of the city, including here uh, shown Bianca. So I'm, I'm so happy that all of our conversations uh, have now led us to this moment where you are, you have your work in New York. I know you're very proud of that. So Jackie, I'd love for you to greet the audience. And um, if there's anything else you'd like to add, please. Maybe later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, now we know your mic works. Yeah, the mic works. Yeah, it does. Okay. <laughs> but, but thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, thanks for making it possible to be in New York for the first time in my life via Zoom, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit tired because I'm shooting uh, uh, the third day now and it's uh, a bit complicated here. So, but after after 11 hours of work uh, this is my fancy hotel room so uh, give me just a few seconds and uh, maybe i can add something later sure okay? sure okay. yes but you you are speaking to us from uh, luneburg in germany yes yes i'm in the that small town in northern part of germany here yeah yeah <laughs> almost Very on old town <laughs> Yeah, it's a medieval town and it's, a it's medieval back, town. backdrop yeah. to the uh, the drama. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Picturesque, picturesque city for picturesque people. And yeah, that's it, that's right. <laughs> okay, well, we'll let you uh, warm up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, and uh, okay. we'll come back, great. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, Victoria, if you could show Texas Isaiah's. Yeah, thank you. 
Hi, Texas Isaiah, wonderful to have you with us. Um, we actually haven't gotten to have a conversation yet, but um, I got to know your work via uh, Facebook, which, um, yeah, it's not great in many ways, but I, I love that it continues to um, expand my network and, and, and yeah, knowledge of uh, photographers, contemporary photographers. But what happened was um, someone shared um, an interview um, that you had given to Vogue uh, Vogue UK, and you were discussing what it was like to shoot um, the cover with one of your heroes, Janet Mock, um, along with five other activists for their September 2020 issue. And um, I loved what you had to say in there about hoping one day you wouldn't just be doing a number of firsts, but it would be perfectly ordinary for uh, a Black trans man to, of course, be shooting <laughs> uh, photographs for Vogue. Um, and when I was researching your work, um, trying to figure out who, who is this incredible photographer, I was blown away by not just the editorial work that's come to the limelight, into the limelight more recently, but also this epic 2012 project you did called Blackness. Um, it's a visual project that documented and celebrated the African diaspora's diversity across the spectrums of gender, sexuality, and ethnic heritage. Um, it's available to be uh, seen on your website, uh, texasisaiah.com. So I hope everybody checks it out. Um, and also the portrait and self-portrait that we have included here um, in the exhibition are from uh, two different series that um, you created afterwards, but both of them were about the search um, to consider the broad visual needs of black and of color trans and gender non-conforming people. Um, and I'm also using your words here to consider the broad visual needs. I hope um, we'll come back to that because I think also this being the um, Transgender Day of Visibility, um, it's for me really important that we put the needs of, of the people uh, being portrayed in one way or another, visible or not, um, forward and not only um, thinking about what kinds of images we want to see. Um, so Texas Isaiah, I, I very much welcome you now if you'd like to, to greet us and um, if there's anything else that you'd like to add. Hey, um, hey everyone. Hi. Hope um, everyone is, you know, doing okay during this time. Um, but yes, it's such an honor to be here. Um, <laughs> I've been running around so much, so I feel like I'm, you know, right, around, right along with, with Jackie on, you know, just being a little tired, but um, it's, it's nice to be in this company, this virtual company, um, and to just be in this show. Um, I feel like it's the first um, group exhibit that I've done in a long time. Um, and, you know, I feel like the work is at home in the space, um, which is very important to me, but, um, you know, I feel like with these two images, and even you mentioned in Blackness, um, you know, this image that everyone is um, currently witnessing right now was actually my first, um, I would say, uh, like, serious venture into producing color photographs because I'm a little colorblind. So mm -hmm. everything prior um, that I had created was black and white, and I love black and white images, but I feel like, you know, sort of being in California, um, really expanded my, um, my knowledge of, of color in a lot of ways. Um, and it was really important you know, for me to introduce my experience, my body, my spirit into my own work um, because I was photographing everyone else. And you know, I think when it comes to considering the needs of others, we also have to consider our needs as well. Um, so, you know, that's very important, but I'm going to leave it there. Um, I'm very honored to be here again. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I'd just like to open the floor um, to, to any of you, if you'd like to um, respond to the question of what aspects of making portraiture do you love and which aspects do you struggle with? So it's kind of a, a process question. I'll start since um, I like the aspect of connecting with people, um, people I admire, sometimes desire. Um, but I struggle 
with the necessity of having an apparatus, a camera um, between us, um, because I think it gets in the way. And it also has this phallocentric and colonialist legacy mm -hmm. that um, I find important to disassociate with. But it's still necessary. We haven't we haven't managed to do it by just looking at each other and creating an image. Yeah, that's Not what yet. I came up with. <laughs> yeah. And what about you, Zachary? You know, I always say that I think photographing somebody is an excuse to fall in love with them. <laughs> and I've often felt, even with strangers, a kind of um, just a shared um, corporeal presence and moment that is completely unique. The chemistry that we create with our bodies and with our presences. And I think the biggest challenge is to cut through the noise of the world. Um, it is such an infinitely distracting environment that we're in in 2021. And there are so many diversions and ways around being present and being completely uh, in your body and with another person. Um, so, and I think that's the challenge for everybody right now is learning to kind of cut through the noise. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, Jackie, you, you often do, uh, party photography or night photography. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering about the way in which the camera, um, yeah, how, if, if it makes sense to you with what Del was saying that sometimes it gets in the way or do you sometimes consider it more of like a tool to connect or a way know. to talk to people? For, to me, it, it, it's very different. It's, uh, it's, it's I, I need the apparatus somehow, but, but this is, this is part of personal history maybe because, because I've, I've, I've been working with uh, I've, I've made films before uh, uh, and I've, I've been photographing before I became Jackie, you know, so I, I had a professional life before as, uh, and I started uh, uh, first as a photographer, then uh, uh, for some reason I burned all my negatives uh, and, and uh, um, started uh, kind of a career in Neue Deutsche Film, like New German Cinema. Uh, at least that's what I tried to do. Uh, made two feature length uh, movies uh, with uh, uh, an art, uh, with the art department of the public broadcasting ZDF, and this is, uh, which is the second biggest public broadcasting in, in Germany uh, <clears throat> in, for, for their night shift program, uh, which were very, very, uh, well, they, they were, they had, yeah, they, they were very well uh, acclaimed, criticized. I don't know the, the, the correct word. My English is too Polish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, no, they, were, they were acclaimed. Uh, but so, so yeah, for you, yeah. it, but, but you had then, a very different route to, to yeah. picking up the camera. Yeah, but then, but then uh, uh, when, when I, uh, uh, when it became obvious that I would, would not further be hair buyer, but uh, uh, would start to be Frau buyer, which was back in the 90s, uh, nobody called anymore for a couple of years maybe and then after uh, somehow I found a way back to uh, uh, television which was very important for me uh, uh, as a transsexual person because everybody said welcome to suicide country back then uh, uh, if you're doing it you will be uh, out of everything 
So it was very important to, to come back somehow uh, to working in the industry, which was, but which was very frustrating because uh, you know, uh, doing soap operas, which is yeah, which is the the, the current name of of what what we are doing in in, in the uh, in the industry, in the television industry, is um, uh, making very very formatted uh, formatted viewing, you know, which is like uh, very very strict, which is uh, uh, the way we show the world. And, is the way people will see the world, of course, which is very linear, very uh, uh, unemotional, uh, even if we are talking uh, about emotions from uh, from uh, dawn till uh, the bright moonlight. But um, I had the feeling that 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 also the way I saw the world changed a lot since I was. Uh, Frau Bayer, since I was Jackie, you know, that there was no going back, there was no possibility to go back to the POV. I had somehow learned, somehow, yeah, learned to take during my, my whole upbringing, which was, of course, I, I, was, I was brought up as a boy, uh, then later as a man. And, there was no way back to that after I was Jackie. So yeah. that if, if anyone, if anyone would say uh, that that she'll be someone's mirror, or so I couldn't, I couldn't subscribe to that point of view because my mirror then was broken. It was just, or it was blind somehow. So I needed some, I needed some, some, some reliable apparatus, some, some, some sort of, of uh, a technical gear uh, to even make the, wor the world uh, uh, be visible for me. So that was the first thing. And then of course, I went uh, uh, to places uh, where I'd uh, uh, seldom been before because all the hetero uh, parties didn't, didn't want to let me in anymore. And even homosexual parties back then in the 90s were kind of strict with trannies. So I went to a place uh, we, uh, uh, they named the House of Shame, which is a party in, in Berlin hosted by a transsexual who's been uh, uh, on the streets for 17 years before he started this party, uh, which is still going on after more than 20 years now, uh, which is still running. And um, yeah, I started photographing there. I just jumped into the darkness with my camera uh, and, and at the same time, like shot, which is a word we don't like for photographing, <laughs> but at the same yeah. time, I, uh, I, I uh, focused and shot or disfocused and shot and uh, uh, eagerly wanted to be hit at the same time, you know, so that's, mm -hmm. that's how it all, that's how it, or began the second time. The first time right. was very, very different. The first time was in the 80s and it, it, I, I just wouldn't talk about it now. So because it's an awful long story. I'll cut it short now. So. Yeah, but I'm I think sorry. it's, I mean, but this is, this is, you know, what seems like a simple thing of picking up a camera is actually a hugely complicated endeavor. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of how, as a technology, it interacts with where you are with your point of view as a gendered person in this world. Yeah, but I, I do want to also extend um, to Texas Isaiah, like, how did you get into photography? Um, um, <laughs> yeah, did you have mentoring or what, what, was, um, what was kind of your history of, of the art form? You know, I feel like I've had, you know, different sort of evolutions within it because I think that I started out of not knowing really what else to do and I think blackness was the first project that that I felt like cemented me as a solo artist because it was the first project that I had developed as a solo artist everything else that I had did prior was more collaborative 
And, you know, ironically enough, like I started photographing in nightlife, which I feel like a lot of queer and trans photographers do because that is, you know, our go-to space um, in a lot of ways. And that's where it started. Um, But I didn't deem that kind of work um, as important. And that was because I was being told that that work wasn't being, that, that work wasn't important. Um, you know, from other people who, you know, may have been in different industries, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, like Blackness, you know, you know, that start beginning that project was a very difficult time for me because I was like on the verge of losing 13 people in my life in the span of eight months. And, you know, that amount of grief had affected so many different sections of my life because there was a lot of people from childhood that passed away. I had a coworker who I was close with who passed away. And the last person out of that carousel was my grandfather who I had only met twice. Um, you know, he, uh, you know, was, um, had resided in Guyana. Um, and also I was, although I don't really mention this um, very often, it was also like, the affirmation of me trying to determine what transness meant for me and, um, you know, consenting to medically transitioning. And so it was a very (laughs) intense time, you know, and also an intense time culturally because that was the first wave of the trans tipping point Mm -hmm. as people refer to. Um, So it was, you know, seeing, you know, black trans people, primarily black trans women, Laverne Cox, Jenny Mock, who were being photographed. And I think that it allowed me to, um, I think just approach the the medium a lot more differently because there was no, or a lack of of historical marking of trans people that I um, uh, had witnessed, you know? And so I think that for me, you know, although I was creating work prior to that, I started to ask more important questions like, you know, how can, is it possible to be responsible um, when you are, you know, developing work um, within a medium that has caused so much historical violence and still continues to? And knowing that even if I hold the camera, I can still actually perpetuate those things. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, yes, that project allowed me to, to ask those important questions around you know, responsibility, you know, space, because all of those images were taken in my home. Um, You know, I was living in a a queer and trans house, you know, and um, (laughs) had housed 100 people, you know, around 100 people for, you know, in five, six years with my roommates during that time. Um, And yeah, it just made, um, I don't think that it made the process easier, um, but it made it worthwhile, if that makes sense. Yeah, but it sounds like like a lot of things came together. There was an incredible confluence that uh, also maybe of the like cultural context as well as personal um, of what you were really wrestling with. Um, but yeah, I think the result is so incredible too, um, maybe because of that poignancy. And as far as mentorship, you know, I was talking to a friend, nobody wanted to mentor a queer trans person, mm. you know, um, and so a lot of the mentorship as it continues to this day comes from peers and friends, mm-hmm. you know, but yeah. Well, this is, I've, I've had conversations with both Adele and, and Zachary kind of about um, like intergenerational, but also um, um, I think Del, you used the word like interracial agency and production. Um, so like cross community and cross age, um, um, age differences I just I wondered if if either of you'd like to speak to that on the topic of mentoring um or maybe just having relationships friendships um Del it looks like you've unmuted you want to go for it no Zachary's unmuted too no you first Del (laughs) okay um I think um I found very few mentors. Actually, I did say something about this. I was I was very much rejected um, when I first started photographing my queer community, Leather Dykes, um, 
super butch passing women, um, hyper femme sex worker girlfriends of them. And whereas I was very much lauded as being this, I was a babe, I didn't know it, but I was a babe. And I was this young girl in the mission street making photographs of the people who I lived with. I lived in the mission street, but it didn't feel right. I didn't know anything about colonization or the colonized gays. And I brought pictures back to the people on the streets and looking at them now, I'm amazed by them, but it still wasn't my community, even if we lived in proximity to each other. When I started making photographs about my sexuality, about lesbians, dykes on bikes and all of that, um, the powers that be, my teachers, my fellow students, the administration really rejected me. And so I dropped out. So I never got my um, BA degree from the San Francisco Art Institute, even though I founded the first lesbian and gay association there. But I can, I, Jeb, I, Jeb is getting a lot of attention. Joni Byron is getting a lot of attention for her first book on photographs. And then it was like, okay, these are the lesbian uh, politically correct images. And I took a workshop from her and I thought she was gonna really, you know, be rejecting as so many lesbian feminists were of my work at the time. And instead she was great and she really accepted me. So. Although it was only a weekend workshop and I wouldn't say she was my mentor, her not rejecting me and encouraging me to follow my own path yeah. was really important. Um, Kate Millett, sexual politics, uh, first, second wave feminist, she also supported my work. So Joan Nessel, um, and then, but the most important one and the one who led me on the journey I am now is Kate Bornstein. And when I photographed her for Gay Times, she was like, hey, I'm going up to this thing, queer up north, hop on a train with me. You can sneak it, I'll pay for you if you, if you get caught. And Pratiba <laughs> Pamara, lesbian film, filmmaker said, yeah, you can sleep in my room. So I crashed queer up north and you know, I think Kate was the one who made sense of what I am, which I call gender queer, trans in the broad sense, but my narrative wasn't the same as a trans man. And later I discovered I was intersex or intersexy as I like to call it. And um, that, I, I guess Kate was probably the person who, created the space for me to see what I could be. Yeah, yeah. And then Claude Cahun as, um, as someone whose work um, most closely resembled mine in terms of self-portraiture and in terms of being politically engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's such an important also, um, yeah, legacy, right, to, to, to be able to connect with. Um, now, Zachary, I have a million questions. <laughs> I'm not sure who, which direction to go into, but maybe you just want to jump in. You have something. Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to, you know, shout out my own kind of guardian angels, Auntie Kate Bornstein being one of them. Um, I found my way to her book, Gender Outlaw, when I was 14 years old and had gotten in the habit of shoplifting from Barnes & Noble with one of my friends and I snatched up Kate Bornstein's <laughs> gender outlaw and really understood myself as as transgender for the first time even though it took many years to manifest that um having none of the the means and it was you know such a different time uh you know adolescent transitions at the time were unheard of and still are to this day in Syracuse New York where I grew up, um, but I moved to New York City the day after I graduated high school, two days after. And I met Flawless Sabrina in a nightclub and she, you know, I was drawn to her like a moth to the light 
And it's so interesting when it comes to mentors and I think about the trans, femmes, the non-binary, gender expansive um, people who really impacted my developmental years and none of them are visual artists. None of them ever had the, the, the means. I mean, um, you know, most of them were uh, sex workers in their day. I'm thinking specifically of um, Hollywood Lawn, of Alexis Del Lago. Um, Alexis Del Lago moved from Puerto Rico to New York City in 1958 and wanted to be a designer. And she was kicked out of Parsons for, for dressing as a woman. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she designed costumes for Jackie Curtis plays and she was in Jack Smith uh, films and she was kind of always on the periphery of things and would have been a great artist had she um, lived in a different time. And Holly and Flawless as well, like, it, you know, it was so, um, in incredible to glean their survival strategies to understand what it took for them to really cross through the fire. Um, yeah. Flawless had been organizing drag contests across the US. She, you know, had dozens of um, arrests and incarcerations and in the 1960s for organizing you know queer communities in, in different spaces and um holly as well you know lived much of her life in dire poverty um all the while appearing in independent films and in um even kind of you know small budget queer cinema of the 90s um, so often when I'm asked about my, my favorite artists, I'm, I realize that I'm naming people who didn't create work so much as their lives were mm -hmm. works unto themselves and the ways that they were able to claw out space for themselves in a world that would have erased them entirely, would have preferred that they didn't exist at all. Um, I'm so comforted to be living in the future, um, to be alongside so many visionaries and dreamers who are doing this work in synchronicity, in tandem, in alliances with each other. And it will take all of us doing this at the same time for the rest of our lifetimes in order to really push the needle. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, about singular people. It's not about the people whose names we know even. I mean, that's the other thing is like our mentors are spirit guides. Our mentors so often are people whose names we will never know who are touching us nonetheless, you know, yeah. or push, pushing for us in the other dimension. Um, I think also what you're you're speaking to is um, a particular dynamic, like uh, with with Flawless and um, Hollywood Lawn. Like there's, they live their lives, like you said, as artworks, but also very much in front of um, various kinds of cameras. And um, what's striking to me about your all stories is what happens when you take the camera in your own hand and you're a part of that creation story. Um, there's already a, a question coming in about um, responsibility and, and ethics. And I'm wondering also like Texas Isaiah, you mentioned like, oh, back then that was the, <laughs> the beginning of the transgender tipping point. And, and we're already, um, what is it? Six, seven years on, <laughs> I don't know, Corona years are a little difficult to calculate, but <laughs> we're, we're somewhere further. Um, I'm just wondering where you think the discussion around visibility is, where do you want it to be? Um, or, or what, when thinking further, like where, where would you want people in 50 years, maybe who are listening now and they're 12 years old, where do you think <laughs> the world, what would it look like for them? 
um, this kind of question around transgender visibility? Uh, I'm a little anti-visibility, actually. Um, you know, just that's, because- That's I a very welcome I, answer. <laughs> I mean, you know, because I think that, you know, the pictures can look great and the dresses can look great and the, <laughs> the, the clothes can look, the fashion could be great, but you know, where are the resources? And I think that's the most important thing to um, acknowledge is that also, for one, visibility is not always consensual. You know, and that's something that I like to tell people that this, it's not consensual. Um, you know, I think that sometimes we also don't have a choice in, you know, whether or not we sustain visibility because some of our work, uh, the work that we do, um, it has to be visible um, in some capacity. Um, but also visibility doesn't grant safety. Um, it doesn't always grant resources. It doesn't always grant these things that people assume that you gain when you do step into that space. Um, and I'm also, you know, I don't like how people are pedestaled, you know, when they are visible, um, because I think that the goal to, to exist in is not to be perfect, but to be better. And, you know, when you're doing that in front of an audience, um, you know, people are going to fuck up, pardon my language, but, you know, that's, it, it's going to happen. Um, as it should, right? Because I feel like we're all, um, hopefully, you know, most of us are doing work to undo so many of the things that we've been taught. Um, and so, yeah, I think that visibility, I mean, I think that it can, it can feel good for a moment, but I think that the longevity um, for me just comes with the resources, it comes with care, it comes with, you know, trans people having access to housing and employment, um, to medical care, to all of these things that we deserve. Um, mm -hmm. And up until, you know, until that time arrives, um, I think each year that passes by, I'm so, I'm left so flat, flattened by visibility. It, it doesn't feel as good anymore because I know that it's going to be fleeting, um, you know, but I think that at the same time, you know, for me, I think uh, the, the kind of access and the privilege that I have, it also allows me to support others in a way that I may not have been able to. Um, and that is something that I really love to do. And it's also something that I don't also uh, always feel like has to be done in public, <laughs> you know, you know, showcasing that kind of support, that kind of care, that kind of intention. Um, and so, yeah, I think that those are the, you know, the good things about it is that I can be a mentor to people. I can be a friend. I can be a peer. I can, mm -hmm. you know, send my resources to people, pass on work to people. That is great. Um, but I also want people to be taken care of as well. Yeah. I'll, I'll chime in too. Thank you so much for that, Texas. I, say, I think that we are faced with so many empty signifiers, you know, and that sometimes it feels very, uh, you know, sending you, my ho sending you my hopes and prayers, you know, had that became this kind of empty, sentiment from politicians where you're like, okay, that doesn't actually get at any of the <laughs> heart of the systemic inequality, the things, whatever it is, whatever the thing at hand is, it's like this kind of um, an empty signifier. And I think for, for me, visibility has always been, uh, personally, I feel that great privilege comes with great responsibility and to you know, the visibility doesn't come naturally to me. I'm an introvert, I'm not a performer, but that um, I have the, the privilege yet. <laughs> of familial support, of support yeah. from an enabling community, of being set up and realizing like, there is no other way for me to live my life other than to be visible for those who, who cannot. And I, I think that cis allies <laughs> are also, it's like, you know, trans people might not always be safe being visible and it's up to other people to be visibly, you know, advocating for the rights of the most marginalized people in their communities. And it's the only way to ethically live one's life. Um, trans folks have only survived by being invisible in, in past generations by assimilating so effectively that nobody would know your trans history 
or for those who didn't have passing privilege to be creatures of the night and to only um, move around in concealed ways. I was talking to an incredible um, black trans woman in um, Mississippi who was talking about, she said the biggest impediment to her local community was that trans people didn't feel safe leaving their houses. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, being conscious of, and visibility, you know, it, it's yet to be seen what the larger impact of that is. Does it actually make people more vulnerable, us being in the consciousness? But at this point, you know, trans and non-binary binary people circulating in public life is a global conversation. It's a national conversation. We've become this wedge issue um, that state to state, you know, folks are trying to legislate against us having access to medical care, having access to, you know, school sports for, for young people. Um, you know, it's an uh, unprecedented time that we're in, and yet the future is always both better and worse simultaneously. The future is always, um, you know, that, that organizing and uh, creating a, a cohesive movement around the rights of, of trans and non-binary people grows alongside opposition. You know. Can I say something? Yes, Del, uh, please. What I feel is that, you know, I live in middle Sweden. It's not a cool, queer city by any means, but I'm pretty much a public person. And my ability to be visible is also a function of my whiteness. Um, some of you might know, let me, some of you might know that um, I have, I'm a, I'm a mapa. I have two small children who are also doing, uh, we've done Der Spiegel, we've been in the Netherlands, big documentary in France, recently Vice, Raised Without Gender. We're all public people. Well, not my ex-partner, but we, we are an entirely non-binary family. And we do not experience um, no discrimination or no problems, but I would, uh, you know, I argue that our ability to be visible is because we're white, um, we are educated, uh, the kids at least are trilingual and astonishingly beautiful and beauty is a passport in many ways. So they see being non-binary as an advantage rather than a disadvantage. They, you know, my youngest who's, or my oldest who's nine gets to have their own shower. That they, they can regulate the water um, pressure and temperature. Everybody else has to have cold showers. So for them, there are definite advantages and, there are advantages to being public, but it is also something that for me is, you know, we, we're public, we do this visibility work because we can and because we have the privilege and because we believe it's important to show how things could be for everyone, mm -hmm. you know, for them, they're, really valued members of society, of their, of their group. They're not bullied um, and they stick up for the kids, the very few kids of color in their class that there are. So for me, it's important that they realize it's not a big deal. I mean, they can even let go of their um, need to be called hen, which is a non-gender pronoun in, pronoun in Sweden. And because they understand other people have a harder life. Um, 
so they can sublimate their own needs in a way that I've found a lot of adult trans people can't. And they can tell you what the difference is between being trans, non-binary. And I don't, I don't know, it's like, it's an extraordinary experiment in a way for me or a laboratory to see how these kids can be raised in a gender-free environment and thrive. So visibility is a double-edged sword and it's a privilege. And it's a privilege granted mostly to white, middle-class educated people. Yeah, <laughs> um, definitely in the, in the media eye, but I do think something that Texas Isaiah mentioned is that we don't always consent to visibility and there is a long tradition of trans people, especially trans femme people um, being portrayed by um, photographers that are not necessarily a part of their community. Um, and, uh, yeah, you don't want to give away all agency to somebody in the way that they express themselves or uh, interact with the camera. But I do, I do want to ask you about how, what are your considerations when you are doing a portrait with somebody? Like, how do you think about the ways that you, you want to shift the, the relationship between the gaze, the sitter, and the, yourself as the photographer? Um, I think it's interesting to talk about this as like a technical, as well as like, you know, what kinds of conversations maybe do you have? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing if I can connect it. There's a question um, that came in through the chat about um, the, the role or the importance of, of the body. Um, so I'm thinking about like photographers like Zanelli Mohole that will always um, use a quarter turn um, and and have a jacket over um, the chest in order to kind of protect um, their 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 uh, their sitter um, from being misread in terms of gender. Um, so I'm just kind of yeah I'm, I'm interested in the kind of nerdy way as like the technical aspect of the set up with the camera? How do you talk to people? What kind of space do you want to be in? Um, as, as well as what kinds of uh, conversations you might have. Jackie, you haven't spoken very much. Jackie, we want to know. <laughs> um, Working with subjects. Yeah, maybe you can speak about the, in particular, how in the in the Royal uh, Bar series, because that was a very different. It, there's, it's not a studio. <laughs> um, you're in you're in the bar, the brothel. Um, how did that project develop? I'm sorry, something went wrong. I can't see myself here anymore. Okay, here it is. Um, I mean, it wasn't a studio, first of all. It, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, uh, well, <clears throat> after all, of course, it was a setup because it was a bar, it was a brothel. So, uh, and we were, we were in that brothel and uh, uh, we were all, all of us were working there. We were all, the working girls were all transsexuals as we said back then. So they were all um, trans persons, you know, so um, girls, of course, women. And um, um, the idea was to, yeah, to, to, to portray them as, as the girls they were, because they, I mean, being 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 one of the working girls there, I was uh, uh, I was interested in in a way uh, how I myself came in there. How did I how did I fit in there, or uh, or how did I not fit in there? So I wanted to 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 know more about these persons, about these girls, um, colleagues, friends, 
whatever you you might say it, it and, and the best way uh, uh, to connect or to relate to each other was this this game we played with the with, with the camera and then then uh, at at a certain point the <clears throat> uh, with, I, I think it's called the board in English the old one the old lady uh, said well okay let's let's use it maybe uh, or let the girls use it for uh, uh, for ads for 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 their own uh, PR somehow yeah. and, and then it became kind of, of of a project that I said well okay uh, um, uh, we do the po we, we we do the photographing and, and 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 they get all the photos they want, but also I get the photos um, I want, and and we pick the photos uh, after shooting. We pick all the photos they wanted and the photos I wanted, and we we talked about it. And it, it was it, I I think it was more it was more like fun and what what i, I think also what, what zachary told uh, 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 talked about before it was they became kind of spiritual guides for me i mean I, i've learned so much from from a person like julia you know mm -hmm. uh, um, more than i would have ever learned from from any mentor or teacher which i never had so uh, because everything was diy in a way um, <clears throat> so yeah what was the question <laughs> <laughs> no, well i did we've we've talked in, in another context about uh, julia being such an uncompromising uh person that yeah, she did not yeah. compromise for anyone um but also with the the relationship that you developed with all the different girls working yeah. there um like for them it was also a chance to see them the way that you saw them which was yeah which, not was, which was different which was different from the way maybe uh, uh other people would have seen them and especially it was very different from 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 how the the, the clients saw them of course which was uh, which was well on one hand it was sometimes it was really disappointing for them because they wanted really really like body shots for uh for for newspaper uh, ads or something which they didn't get you know but but on the other hand it was very um Maybe it was it was it, it revealed their their own beauty to them. It revealed it revealed in a way. I had the impression that it revealed in a way the uh, uh, the way they looked like. You know the, the way they yeah. And maybe it changed also the way the way they they looked at themselves. I, I don't I don't know exactly, but I know that that with uh, with some of them because um, the, the photos all uh, the first photos uh, I, I made at, at the Royal Bar uh, were made in two thousand and three, and 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 we never got. I mean, we we were always connected, and I, we went on so every time we saw each other. Uh, um, either they asked for photos to be taken, or I asked for photos to be taken, and and so this this went on, and later it became this 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 um, kind of this catalog. This it's it's not a book yet. It, it, I, probably it will never be a book, but it's a catalog. It was uh, in the end. It became a little funding, so it went on over twenty years, maybe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, photographing them. And the same when the the same happened with the House of Shame. So that it was twenty two, twenty three years or so. Yeah. Um, well, maybe if there's anyone on the call, please, if you have some funding and you want to help Jackie make this book. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, but what I wanted to say is that there, it's 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 not been it's it's not been theoretical in any way. You know, it's not been. Uh, um, uh, I didn't reflect on this in terms of like art history or uh, photographic history or. Uh, uh, theory of photography and uh, colonization or anything it just it just happened we were there and it happened so and then then of course all the other stuff uh, came so to whom do you show these photos uh, um, they the part uh, parts of the, the the of them were in museums before in 2006 2007 there was a a big uh, um, exhibition, uh, a really large exhibition with three institutions in, in Berlin uh, titled Sex Work. So then came the questions which photos to give there and which photos not to give there. So that's that's but that's that's not that's not been part of the original process. The original process was kind of a initiation like you know like we, we've been talking about this the feeling i had that this is a cave like like in in prehistoric times this is a cave and we all threw color to each other and and uh, uh, made kind of a yeah initiated a cult of <laughs> yeah yeah, of the, so, of the working girls there. Yeah, of the working girls, the cult of the working girls. <laughs> I think we have the title of the book. <laughs> the cult of the working girls. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I you can also see we only were able because it's a small museum, only able to select three images. But mm -hmm. um, I I hope there is a book because having looked at this archive, um, it's incredible how playful and uh, present people are with each other, which is, is, is really hard to get if you are um, just kind of coming in, you meet somebody and you're like, okay, let's do this. You know, you can really see there's an established relationship and that people are in, mm -hmm. in it, uh, in the game. Um, and Victoria, I'd also like to give the word to you to talk about um, the playfulness and the experimentation um, with, within Alice Austin's um, body of work. Um, and I know you you have an image behind you uh, of hers, but is there any any other image that you want to show us or or discuss? Um, not necessarily to present you with a, a a show of Alice's work. I think that anyone that's here today can go to our website, and it's just Alice Austin, you know, dot org, um, and actually take a virtual tour of radical tenderness, which is really wonderful to be able to move through the galleries um, and see the work as it has been installed. Um, this is actually Alice behind me. It's obviously Alice with her two Julias. Um, and it's a very rare photograph of her actually smiling, but she is very comical and witty in her photographs that were intended like this one probably just for personal circulation and you know we're just so lucky now to be able to explore these additional narratives in Alice Austin's work and what what is really key with the work of you know um, working with artists such as yourselves um, is that you know, Alice Austin's been closeted for a very, very long time. And that's incredibly damaging to the queer community in itself who long recognized um, her identity. And so the work that we do and I do at the Alice Austin House is really trying to um, work with contemporary photographers to explore these narratives and connections um, in Alice Austin's work. And, and working at the Alice Austin house is like having a second home and you're, you're living with her. And there's so little scholarship on, on Alice and her life um, that 
that it's 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 incredibly organic and it keeps growing right and my understanding of Alice and her work and her intentions uh, keeps growing and and doing um, this work with you Eliza and working with Dal and Zachary Texas Isaiah and Jackie uh, and really looking at their works and by the way there is additional works at in the show if you come to the site on pers in person uh, we have a video screening of Zachary's She Gone Rogue and we have um, materials, printed materials from all of the artists. And it expands my um, understanding and I hope everyone that visits the house, the understanding of the connections that Alice's work can make in a contemporary context mm -hmm. and how we as a museum um, can play a really interesting role in inviting uh, storytelling uh, opportunities. And I really loved listening to each of the artists today and from Texas Isaiah talking about taking images in their home and Alice was so focused on the home as muse as well. And so many of her really important photographs are taken um, in the grounds or in the house. Um, and Zachary's, you know, talking about intergenerational um, mentorship, inspiration. Um, I feel like Alice plays a part in that. And we do intergenerational storytelling for queer teens and sages. And some of the work that comes out of this, these programs is just so beautiful. So there's this sort of combination between work being created at the house and then bringing together these shows um, where you see Julia in a room that was built in 1690, or you see Texas Isaiah's self-portrait in what was Alice's bedroom um, and Dell's image of David in his bedroom in Alice's, what was Alice's bedroom for her entire life living there. And these other stories of struggle um, are connectors to what Alice's story um, ended up being, you know, I mean, she was white and she was privileged, but she lost all of her money. And her and her partner Gertrude Tate obviously were evicted from the home. And she ended up in the poorhouse signing a note saying she had less than $20 to her name. And you know, her and her beloved were not buried together as they wished. Um, so, I, you know, it's so wonderful to kind of do this work and, and make these connections um, at the Alice Austin House. And, it, you know, it's a real pro privilege, obviously. And I just was so excited to meet you all here today, virtually. But thank you. And thank you, you know, I thank you all for how many, you know, how much deep thinking goes into producing a show like this and a catalog uh, with it. Um, yeah, it's so important. And the funding is so important. So a big thanks to the National Endowment of the Arts for funding this and Department of Cultural Affairs. It's a big deal. Yes, that's a that's an important note. <laughs> to, it is can't yeah. do it without it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can do some, but this is a very beautiful show. Yeah. Um, maybe could could you throw the link uh, to the Alice Austin House uh, so people can go to the virtual tour into yep. the chat? And we do. I haven't seen any other questions coming in. Um, if is there anyone who'd like now to or prefer to just um, ask it? Um, you can unmute yourself. Del? Yeah, I mean, I've thought a lot about, um, this is for all of us, but I've thought a lot about of what I'm gonna call cross-racial um, presentation. Um, and representation. And I know that it's been something because, you know, as a lesbian photographer that I was, um, and as one of the few people who 
maybe have not benefited economically in the way that some other lesbian photographers have. Um, I do have some cultural capital and I do get published. And it's a question of like, how do I represent my community and what is my responsibility um, for representing people that don't look like me? Um, and that's changed over the time. Now it's something that I know I was invited to South Africa before Nelson Mandela um, was freed and I refused to go because I did not want to be a white person representing South African queer people. And eventually Zanele Mohale and other people got that space and are now doing that work. But what is my responsibility for the different kinds of queer and trans communities that I've worked with? And what happens when I collaborate with artists that I have like Majisola Adebayo that took me to the Antarctic to work with her, with Zach Nataf, um, with, an, with a number of other people that I've collaborated with. And what is seen as being my agency, you know, my, I am the one who is supposed to be the sole creator, the auteur, and how does their agency get erased? These are a lot of questions that I deal with all the time. But how does a white photographer work with black and brown subjects that may have asked me to work with them, but then everything is credited to me? And there's been some tricky images that have come up that I'm not going to get into. But it's a, a general question about how do white photographers feel about representing um, subjects of color? And how do photographers of color feel about white photographers representing people in their community? Maybe that's narrowing it down a little bit. But it's it's um it's something I think about a lot. Thank you. Um, we don't have so much time to go. I think launch into a longer discussion. But would any of you like to respond to Dell's um, questions? Maybe I can ask because sometimes right there's no there's no answer that's like easy peasy. Let's close off. Um, could I give um, the other three of you a chance to actually post a question that you don't expect to have answered, but you want to have in the room uh, floating out there? Or if there's um, a message that you have, for instance, to um, other trans artists, you'd like to um, either give them a message or ask them a question to consider. Yeah, I was so struck by Jackie's uh, kind of you know, chronicling a community in this unintended way, like, you know, because you're helping the girls by photographing them so they can advertise um, in sex, you know, the sex trades, um, you kind of de facto have this, this archive. And I've found similar, I'm currently working on a project where it's a very similar situation, a photographer who is taking pictures of the girls for their ads has this incredible archive of, you know, some of them are personal pictures and some of them are the more typical body shots. Um, but it's, and I'm also thinking about um, just ethnographic studies in, in general to, to Dell's kind of question as a foundational aspect of photography. You know, the camera was always a tool of colonization. Here in the US, it was, you know, white photographers photographing African-American slaves and indigenous people, but then all over the world that was happening um, in Africa, in India, in um, South America, you know, any colonized country, a, a camera was a, a tool that was used um, to and uh, I, having 
that history it's it's like how do we create a holistic future um and disabuse the history you know like unlodge the the kind of um oppressive gazes of of the camera um I, I, that is, I think, the question of, of representation and of the future. You know, how do we heal from that? How do we um, move in different directions in, in more equitable ways? Mm -hmm. um, Texas Asia, do you want to have a, a moment, a final word? Not really, but <laughs> I am very honored to be here. Um, I think that um, everyone has proposed some very important questions. Um, I do not have any, um, but I will, you know, carry a lot of questions with me, um, you know, from this chat. Uh, and I really appreciate it. And I feel like there's never enough time to talk about all the things anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah. Thank you. True. And Jackie, speaking to maybe other trans photographers or? No, no, no. I'm I'm, I'm no teacher, or or I'm a very bad teacher. All I could say is, uh, this is this is uh, your device. Go out and, and and try what you can do with it. But always, always uh, keep in mind that you're not the only creator, that you're not the sole creator. There is no uh, 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 genius like, like uh, not in art history, nowhere is, n nobody is the sole creator of anything except maybe for God and he had, well, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> You're going to drop it there. <laughs> <laughs> no. He had the problem that nobody believes in him. Or, <laughs> so, so <laughs> no, but that's, that's what I prefer saying. And, and, and when I work, whenever I work with, uh, with, with other people, uh, I, uh, like, like, um, like, like, like I work with Julie or, what, whoever uh, I work with, uh, I prefer uh, I prefer to say that I work for them. Like they are, I mean, um, yeah, work for them, work with them, but they, they have to be uh, in the credit, of course. We had this uh, for, for, for a cover you, you wanted to have. Yeah. It, it up. You know, you remember. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's, forthcoming issue of transgender studies quarterly. Yeah. Jackie has the cover. <laughs> it's very, it's very complicated to credit to credit them all because it's a very long credit. Then, but uh, uh, I guess they all belong uh, in there because I am not the only creator of it. There are many more people, and even in in this uh, uh, um, in, in in this no project. But then, project uh, uh, of of the Royal Bar, um, I have to say, it's a portrait is uh, there the, the the work of the person who sits as well as the person who portrays or the person who shoots or photographs, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's. Um, that's Not an everybody important message. Understand, but, but, sorry. <laughs> no, that's an, that's an important that. message. Oh. Okay, okay. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think so, but I don't mind if <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's all I could say about it. Yeah. Um, Del, Del is asking if we're going to open it up, but no, I was taking the questions via the chat, Dells, and, and when I asked if anybody wanted to raise their hand, we didn't have, um, mm -hmm. 
that happening. So, and we are we are at time. Uh, like Texas Isaiah said, this this conversation could go in many other directions. Um, but I don't want to zoom you all out. You've <laughs> you've given us like a, a really strong ninety minutes um, a focused conversation here about uh, radical tenderness, trans for trans portraiture. Um, this has been recorded. It will be available freely. Um, so share it with your friends, family, mm -hmm. anybody you can think of. Um, you do have um, access to the virtual tour also for free and indefinitely into the future. And there's a free downloadable mini booklet, uh, a catalog um, that contains the, the words and the images um, that uh, come from the different artist um, and my own, um, I'd say, analysis um, of the show. Del? Yeah, I just want to say one thing more about <laughs> queer kinship. Um, I don't know, Zachary, if you agree with this, but I've always considered you my niece, even though I've never met you in person, because Ron Athey always calls you his daughter. Mm -hmm. And, I and dad. We have dads and dad all gave us in common. <laughs> so I see you as my niece that someday I have to meet in person. How do you feel? Is that okay? Can you be my niece? Oh, absolutely. It'd be <laughs> okay. my honor. Thank you. I don't know if I'm aunt or uncle Dale. This <laughs> <laughs> What's the gender neutral aunt uncle? I have no idea. Uncle. Uncle, Steph says. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm glad that you got what that out of the way. <laughs> yeah, I, need, I needed to say Zachary is my niece. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Victoria, I, I'm going to hand back the moderation to you as the, as the director of the museum. And I just want to really give my heartfelt thanks to all of you for cooperating also on very short notice um, and for taking part in, uh, in the show. Um, and I think, yeah, healing, care, love and tenderness um, is something that we all need to be embracing today um, and for the rest of the year on Transgender Day of Visibility. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza. Thank Bye. you so much. Uh, thank you so much for everything that you do and you create. And I think it is just um, another example of, you know, when, when they get together in these spaces and talk like this, there's ways in which um, we can use art as a connector um, and um, an incredible tool to bring us joy and experience so many other things and, and actually have these conversations. Um, so thank you so much for all of your making and doing um, and being here and participating with us. Okay, now we have separation anxiety. Right? <laughs> we, you know what, you know what I do is actually generally say, let's do another Zoom meeting at a time <laughs> where we're not on. Yeah. Like we're not on being recorded or a program. Thank you again, everybody, too, from Culture Pass for making this come together. So so happy that I could be in this room, be a fly on the wall in this Zoom room. So and thank you for all of our audiences. Take yeah, care, everyone. Yeah, take good care. Stay safe. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.